Hello and welcome to Become the Teapot. I'm Ian. And so am I. And this is a podcast about comic books and their film adaptations. And... Kaka! Kaka! Suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping. Rapping at my chamber door? What are you talking about? I don't know, I think that crow's back from last episode. Well, not a moment too soon, because this week we're talking about the 1994 film The Crow. Which, as some of you may or may not know, was based on a comic book of the same name by James O'Barr. Now what are we going to do about this crow? Well, people once believed that when someone dies, a crow carries their soul to the land of the dead. Oh. Ah, I think I'll keep my window shut then. Shall we get started? Yeah. Crow on then. Preamble for both film and comic book, The Crow is a 1994 supernatural revenge film based on the comic book of the same name by James O'Barr. In both film and comic, Eric Draven, after witnessing his girlfriend Shelley's rape and murder, is killed and returns from the afterlife to exact his revenge. Mm, Heavy stuff. Yes, but before we get started, I just want to, well, I've got a bit of a confession to make. Okay. I've never actually seen this film before. The listener may have thought that I have, due to me quoting the film (laughs) at the end of last episode. I apologise if I misled you. I haven't seen this film before, until now. Oh, well, look look at that for transparency. It caught me off, I have seen this film before, but a long, long time ago, and I did not know what you were referencing at the end of last episode. (laughs) (laughs) I did keep a bit of a tally, and they say about 20 times, fire it up. Yeah, two of the villains (laughs) just keeps shouting it to each other. (laughs) So your first time watching The Crow, then? Yes. Did you enjoy it? I think it's a product of its time. It's very 90s. Mm. Yeah, I get vibes of Charmed and Buffy, that kind of era. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, and also there are a lot of cheesy freeze frames, which then fade to black as well. Yes. But yeah, it's a grimy, gruesome, gothic grunge fest, in my opinion. You're really playing into this alliteration lately, aren't you? Yeah, I am. I love it. <laughs> no, but yeah, um, I was watching it, like, the whole way through, I'm thinking, there's gonna be a bit that comes up that I don't like that will ruin the entire film. Right, okay. Or I was worried about it being not as good as everyone has said it has been and it won't stand up to being this sort of hype of a cult classic. Yeah. But overall, it's a love slash revenge story. Yes, definitely. And I really enjoyed it. Oh, good. So it it does stand up to the hype. (laughs) Good to hear. Were you familiar with The Crow beforehand? Do you know much about it? I knew little bits and I'd heard that the film was cursed and this kind of stuff and I knew the... Not so much the plot, but I knew the sort of a couple of story beats. Mm. But yeah, not overly familiar with either comic or film. Right, okay. So you were going in dry, as it were. You were completely unawares. Yeah. Interesting. And I watched the film first and then read the comic. Right, okay. Yeah, I was going to ask that next. So that's interesting. So you were watching this. Yeah, you had a vague idea of the plot is basically it. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you, actually. I think it is very much of its time. It is a a schlocky and melodramatic B-movie. Yeah. But for that reason, I found it very entertaining. Mm. All the cartoonish over-the-top villains with their samurai swords and knives. <laughs> All of yep. the scenes of him brooding on rooftops playing the electric guitar and stuff like that. These really, like you say, gothic shots. I really enjoyed all of that. It's so over the top, you know, setting fire to the petrol and making uh, the crow in flame while he stood nearby. Great shot. Yes. I love that there is a complete lack of restraint to this film. It is pure emo moody gothic behavior and (laughs) and unashamedly so it just says yeah whatever you know that's what we are they were leaning into that aesthetic that sort of grunge aesthetic yeah i would be interested to find out what other films and other media this film inspired Mm. because i think it does fit in nicely with things like sin city Mm. and dread and not dread sorry blade yeah Sin city due to the sort of the grimy crime covered city Mm. and then blade because of its grunge sort of supernatural bits i guess (laughs) yeah blade had that sort of gothic vibe as well but it was more of a sort of techno goth 
you know, early 2000s, late 90s techno goth aesthetic. Mm. But yeah, I mean, absolutely, you can definitely see the influences of this on later works. I think Heath Ledger mm-hmm. has cited it as one of his inspirations for his Joker, and you can definitely see a bit of that. Yep. And it also, tonally, it reminded me a bit of the more recent The Batman. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, they played Nirvana all through the trailers and in that <laughs> film. You know, they really played into the 90s grunge aesthetic inspiration in that film as well. And and there's something really about both films playing that completely straight, you know, really forthright and straight faced about the raw emotion on behalf. There's no like sly wink to the camera. So I could see a lot of Crow in Pattinson's The Batman as well. Now, I liked The Batman, mm-hmm. but I think 13 year old me would have absolutely loved The Batman. <laughs> And I kind of think the same thing about The Crow. I, you know, I sort of vague memories about watching it, but I wasn't that into it. But I imagine if I had seen this at the right age, early teens, you know, yeah. it would have had a profound impact. I can see why it became a cult classic. Mm. There are a few films that I go back to. I mean, I think I've spoken about it on the podcast before that I watched Terminator 2 first mm. and then only in the last couple of years watched Terminator as in the first one. And I didn't think that personally that stood up to the hype of being an amazing film i prefer terminator 2 over terminator 1 but i think that's because i saw it when i was a kid yeah so i think there's that thing of going back to older films and the majority of them don't stand up to the hype or you kind of go what why is this such a good fit like, <laughs> who likes this film i really like the terminator yeah oh yeah i know you do <laughs> but yeah no this yeah this film to me it works so well hmm and yeah, it's really fast paced, but not in a bad way, because effectively it is just he's come back from the dead to take revenge on the people that killed him and his other half. Yes. And then within the first 15, 20 minutes, he's already killed one of the guys. Yeah. So it's pretty you know, right. OK, there's your story. Let's get into it. It's to the point, isn't it? There's only five guys he's coming back to kill, really. The film plot, obviously we'll talk about the comic later, but the film plot is very straightforward in terms of it follows the comics plot line, but that is about it. It, it, yeah. it makes some changes, it gives some more character to some of the supporting cast, the little girl and the cop, uh, particularly Albrecht, having a bit more to do than they do in the comic mm-hmm. book, but um, they really just hammer through and it is fast paced. And I don't know how much of that is to do with obviously the circumstances revolving around the reshoots they had to do after Brandon Lee's death. Mm-hmm. From what I understand, there was only about three days left of shooting shooting when that happened so yeah but that's it i mean obviously one of the most notable things about the film is the tragic events around brandon lee's death so are you aware of those circumstances do you know of the event well like i said earlier i knew the film was cursed because there's always stories about not only about lee but about people being like shocked with power and mm. all these other little small things that happen throughout the filming but yeah the ins and outs of it not really i watched a little bit the other day just to look into it and um, that they used like a prop gun, but then they used it in two different angles, like a close up and a far away shot and a bullet got jammed or something like that happened. I'm not entirely sure the ins and outs exactly. So what it was is they needed a close up shot of the gun, which had prop bullets in mm-hmm. it. So bullets that actually have a tip on them, but they've got no powder in. Yep. So that the close up of the gun, it looks like there's a bullet in there. Rather than using the official prop bullets, they made their own. Right. They took the tips off real bullets, emptied them out and put the tips back on. They then put that bullet in the gun, filmed it, got their close-up shot, and then they were using the same gun for a further out shot where they needed a blank, essentially, which is a, a round with a paper tip but has got explosives in it. So, basically, one of the tips from the day before had got itself lodged in the actual barrel of the gun. So, essentially, you had a whole bullet in that gun. Right. The tip of a bullet is lodged in the barrel. The explosive part of the bullet was in the chamber. Mm -hmm. And he was shot almost point blank in the chest. Uh, Jesus. That's uh, not good. No. Yeah, obviously, he passed away. Like I said, it was, I think it was very, very close to the film coming together. Yes. And I did read about a character that was supposed to be in it. I now can't mem- remember his name. Sort of Scarecrow-esque kind of character. I should have written it down. Effectively, he's the one. He's like a death character almost. He was supposed to be in the film. Yeah, this sort of skeleton with the train that appears briefly in the comic book. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So he was going to be in the film and going to be played by quite a famous sort of stunt actor. Oh, right. Like horror things that you probably know. But yes, yeah, so I think the idea was that he was going to be part of the film. But then this was written out because they'd not filmed those scenes yet and they couldn't do because Lee passed away. So yes. I think there was a little bit of plot restructure when that happened. And I think his stunt double did a few scenes here and there just to fill in for him. Right, okay. But Lee overruled, I say stunt double, Lee overruled did a lot of his own stunts, obviously, to follow in his father's footsteps. Yes, yeah. Which actually, quick little sidestep, I can't believe it's taken us 49 episodes to cover 
this film, <laughs> considering what, what we named ourselves after, yeah. which, if you don't know, it's Become the Teapot, which is a quote from Bruce Lee, Brandon Lee's father. Yep. <laughs> it's taken us 49 episodes to come round to this. <laughs> well, we could also cover some Green Hornet if we wanted to and actually have Bruce Lee involved, but we haven't done that either. So. <laughs> uh, fair enough. Yeah, it was Michael Berryman was the, the chap who was cast as the uh, Skull Cowboy, who was, yeah, the guy who turns up with the train at the end of the comic. Skull yeah. Cowboy, yeah. But yeah, like, I want to actually talk about, we've danced around a few of the characters here and there. Mm. Those street demons, I don't know if they've got an actual name or that is their name, T-Bird, Tintin, Fun Boy, and Skank, which is Tom Tom in the comic, I want to say. Mm. First of all, what stupid names. <laughs> Second of all, they are complete and utter tools. <laughs> they literally take shots. And by that, I mean they swallow a bullet whilst doing shots. Yeah. Which is just, okay, like each to their own, but that's going to hurt <laughs> pooping that out. <laughs> And then you got Top Dollar. Yeah. He's in the film, he's more of like the big bad. Yeah. He's had a bit of an upgrade to be like the gangster, the leader of the town almost. And they're made to be the scummiest of the scum. Yes. You know, filmed in the 90s in this environment, I think it comes across really clear that they are just a bunch of scumbags. Yeah, there's no room for ambiguity. No. It is very much, uh, these are the bad guys. Do not feel bad when they are killed. And you're right, actually. Obviously, the comic book, it's a lot more what happens to to Eric and uh, Shelley is a random occurrence. Their car breaks down, they get picked up. Whereas in the film, it creates a plot line around Top Dollar wanting to get them out of their housing apartment yep. and her putting together a committee to stay there. And that's why it happens to them. So there's a bit more plot line involving, like, it's not just this random act of violence that happens, mm. which actually I feel a little bit undermines the motivation for the comic book. But we'll go on to that later as well. Yeah. Someone that I was impressed to see that I didn't know was in this was Winston from Ghostbusters. Yes. Yeah. That, that's his name, right? Winston? Winston <laughs> I've not seen that in so many years. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. pretty sure. I was watching it. that. I was going, is, is that, that Ghostbusters? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Um, but in the film, he's, he's Detective Albrick? Albright? Albrecht. I can never say names. Thank you. That guy. Which is a bit of a mashup between two characters from the book. You've got the cop that he's named after. Mm. And then you've got Captain Hook. Which yes. Which is quite funny. Yeah. So they sort of put those characters together, which you do get that a lot with like adaptations, that they'll sort of take elements of different characters, put them together, and rework them into the film's plot. Yes. Yeah, he does a really good job, I think. Yeah, I think he's fun. He's good as that sort of buddy cop one person who's going to believe in this supernatural element thing yeah he, he does a good job mm. yeah kind of like um commissioner gordon to batman like he's that kind of character to the crow almost. yeah definitely so again i think this film must have taken inspiration from 89 batman sorry you know it's again it's got that dark tone of, of a batman film yeah, I wouldn't surprise me what came about five years later, didn't it? And there's a lot of leather on show. Yeah. And so, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if it took heavy inspiration from Burton's Batman. Mm. Yeah. Something that I didn't quite understand from the film, even once I'd read the comic, is the crow's powers, exactly. Mm. I get that he can heal. Yes. Fair enough. I get that he's sort of one with the crow that brought him back to life. Yeah. He can also transfer pain, which he does to top dog dollar dog <laughs> the guy at the end top dollar and then he also he can push out morphine from someone's arm by magic <laughs> yeah there was a bit of that in the film because uh, the comic has got very straightforward he is immortal yeah. he's already dead so therefore he can't die mm -hmm. that's pretty much it very straightforward yeah the film definitely had that sort of psychic power resonant power thing he had which he did on both ernie hudson and top dollar yeah and then yeah the heroin curing was a little <laughs> a bit, bit of a odd <laughs> actually specifically didn't they say it was morphine didn't they morphine it yeah, was. Yeah. So it was, yeah but yeah a bit vague whatever the plot demanded at that point i think yeah i think it was just quickly add up the runtime it's only an hour and 40 film so it's quite it's quite a short film yeah. and i said it's fast paced so you fly through it really quickly it's yeah quite good it doesn't stick around on certain scenes too long no i think it is a pretty faithful adaptation mm -hmm. with a few hollywood isms yeah chucked in there you know like car chases the hero loses his powers or his healing powers at the end yes add a bit of suspense and uh, you know there is a climactic final fight and the events are all in the wrong order. But yeah, you know, these things happen when they adapt comics to screen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they got to make a few concessions. But yeah, I mean, speaking of the comic book then, should we move on to The Crow by James O'Barr? Yeah, I don't see why not. So you've already said you read the comic book after watching the film. Yes. What were your initial impressions of the comic book? I 
Loved it, really. It was really, really good. Uh, it's There's a certain poetry to the way it's written. A quote that I've pulled up here is, How wonderful is death, death and his brother sleep, mm. which is hauntingly beautiful. And it's the way that Obar works in some lyrics yeah. from, you know, The Cure yeah. and Joy Division, which they don't seem out of place because the lyrics actually match the, what's the word, the atmosphere mm. of the overall story. And yeah, it's really, really good. I mean, I, I don't really know how to explain it, but it's eerie, but not off-putting and not too much, I think. Yeah. Does that make sense? <laughs> it does make sense. I mean, this is a comic book. It, like you said, it has early references to both Joy Division and The Cure. The main character is named after the Phantom from the Phantom of the Opera. The love interest is Shelley is named after Mary Shelley. Yeah. It is gothic in every sense of the word. I mean, I think it tells you everything you need to know about this comic book yeah. is knowing that there are regular poems dropped in at the end of each chapter, Baudelaire and stuff like that just thrown in there. Mm-hmm. You know me, I'm a, I'm a fairly cynical git. You are. You know, this is a comic book with a lot of characters who will speak in really high strung, taut tension, you know, prose. They will spout poetry and there'll be all these little references and I think that could easily have come across as pretentious. Yes. But I think because this comic book is so earnest, it doesn't. Yeah. The writing you can tell is coming from a genuine place. And yeah, it absolutely won me over as well. Like with the film, if I were reading this for the first time as a teenager instead of a jaded 30-something, <laughs> I would absolutely see myself getting obsessed with this aesthetic and this vibe. You know, this is just... It is atmospheric. Yeah. It's a comic book that is, generates pure atmosphere around it. Mm-hmm. Now, I was reading, actually, I've got the special edition version here. Now, I don't know if you were reading this version or not. I was, actually. Oh, you were? Yes. Okay, so this has got the additional material that was added later as well. And I think it works really well. It's basically stuff that he was saying that he wanted to include in the original prints, but for whatever reason, didn't include them. And so this is like the complete version, as it were. And yeah, I think it's pretty good. So did you read then the introduction? I did, yeah. I normally skip over four words and afterwards and all that sort of stuff because they're like six pages long. And I'm like, I'm here to read the comic. I'm not here to read a book. <laughs> but I thought because of how interested I was in the film, I thought, you know what? I'm going to read every single page of this comic. Mm. And I did. And I thought the backstory was, again, just hauntingly beautiful. Is that's the, that's the phrase that I'm going to use for, 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 this, for this comic book. It's tragic. Yeah. It is so... I mean, obviously, this is a man who... So James O'Barr, for those who don't know, he talks at the beginning of the introduction of this about how he didn't have insurance on his car, so he phoned up his girlfriend to come and get him, and she was struck by a drunk driver mm. and killed. And part of the writing of this comic book is a way of dealing with that grief. He joined the Marines, he shot off around the world. I think he was stationed in Germany when he started writing this. And there's a really German Gothic aesthetic to this as well, which also I think helps inspire it. Yeah. But I think the fact that it genuinely comes from, you know, a place of grief and particularly survivor's guilt. Yes. And I think that is what really comes a lot across in the comic book. The film, a little bit less so, but the, you know, the resolution of this, you've got all the same stuff as the film. You've got him going around killing all of the guys who, who killed his wife or has killed his fiance. You've got all of that in there, but the ultimate resolution is a much more somber affair with him realising that it's more about forgiving yourself. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, the killing isn't what is going to let him rest. It is forgiving himself for the guilt that he feels for his part in it. Rightly or right, Wrongly, you know, it's so much more about grief than it is about a revenge flick. But of course, it's it's also that. Yeah, I think the film tries to sort of sidestep away from that and makes it a bit of a more... They were trying for a blockbuster. I think they did get it, but maybe not in the cinema kind of world. It's funny because, I mean, it wasn't... The film was probably death until... Brandon Lee's death was probably destined to be a straight to DVD so yeah. it was never going to be a big blockbuster really it was only because of Brandon Lee died Miramax stepped in gave him another 8 million dollars or something to finish the film mm, a lot yeah it was basically half the budget of the film again mm-hmm. you know I think before it was like a 16 million dollar film so they stepped in gave him more money to complete it and, and that's why it sort of got more notoriety than you would think so yeah, am I am I right in saying that Obar was the writer and the artist yes you are yeah, yeah. and you can see that very in quality across the issues can't you improvement of skill but also the fact that i think it's this is something that i would show someone and say this is what can happen when one person writes it and draws it Mm -hmm. because often you get the sort of clash of the writer and the artist or the script doesn't quite match the artwork 
and they sort of bounce off each other a bit. But like I said, this this reads like poetry with very melancholy artwork. Yeah, if I can say that word. <laughs> I think you're right. Yeah, I think if it were coming from an artist, a separate artist and writer, you probably wouldn't have the same raw emotion to it, even in its sort of scrappier edges. Yeah, I think it might be too clean, and they might think, oh, well, I'll draw it like this or like that, or I'll stick to the same style all the way through. Where you do feel the the raw pain coming through it almost through the artwork and through the script yeah and i think this is sort of a coping mechanism so he's almost just putting his feelings down on the page you know yeah and yeah there was there's a lot of inspiration from comic books of the time and i think a bit of manga inspiration in there this yeah this thing you got a lot in um early 90s you know late 80s comic books which is you know japanese samurai swords and things like that you know there's there's those things as well in there mm. but the underlying emotion of it is like you say it's far more melancholy yeah there was one bit of the comic that almost crossed the line for me into mark millar's work mm -hmm. we've talked about this before and we both tend to bounce off his stuff quite hard yeah but i think in this it kind of works because it's coming from someone who's gone through the pain so the bit I'm talking about is when there's two thugs and they're attacking this guy. Uh, he's got Down syndrome. Yes. But they think that he's a snitch. So they used a word that I won't use on the podcast. Mm -hmm. That's the bit that almost crosses the line for me into other work. But it's there to show how dark and seeded this world is. And it's not overused. It's just one scene. Yeah. And yes, you have got the sort of sexual contents of it and there's killing of it. And it all works together. But because it's written from someone who's kind of gone through pain, I think it works well as a whole. Yeah, there's a couple of bits which are very much of their time that you probably wouldn't include nowadays there were also a few racial slurs and things that yeah were were showing that the you know all from villainous characters and seedy characters i would say yeah. it wasn't coming from uh, heroic people it was not a way endorsing it but it probably wouldn't be included nowadays i think rather than it being a millar inspired thing i would say it was a miller inspired thing in fact there's a lot of frank miller we talked about sin city the inspiration of this film on sin city the film ah, right yeah but i think in actual fact frank miller's work in the 80s probably had an inspiration on james obar's work i mean it, frank miller uses a lot of japanese inspiration you know samurai swords and that sort of thing with both this wolverine and mm. miko and characters like that in sin city the the grimy cities run by crime so if you liked sin city and you did as well yeah. so i think you might appreciate the crow definitely but yeah like there's even bits in here i mean i don't want to dwell on the sort of pain of of a bar but there's bits where what's his name eric is thinking back to the times that shelly was alive mm. there's like a voiceover of like oh well, i've just popped in to see you i miss your face i miss you know i love you so much all this sort of stuff but then like in the current time he's then cutting up his arm he loves her so much that it's painful for him, so he has to conflict self-harm to cope with the pain. Yeah. And if you, because I read the intro, I took that in a very personal way of like, wow, like this is pure pain and despair coming through the pages. Yeah, you can tell that James O'Barr is using his own experiences to write this character. Mm. You know, it says that actually the last words in the book, I think the outro here, James O'Barr is alive and well at a drawing board somewhere in Texas listening to depressing music with a large cat at his feet. Yeah. You know, the crow is constantly followed around by this huge cat. Gabriel, mm -hmm. you know, you can tell the inspiration for the crow is very personal for him with the added wish fulfillment of cool guns and knives and swords and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, just talking about cats then, because that's something that I spoke about his powers, as in the crow's powers in the film. Mm. In the comic, very, very similar. Healing powers, he's one with the crow, all of this sort of stuff. But he can also control cats, <laughs> which is shown when he saves Sandy from Fun Boy. Yeah. And he's like, oh, I've got some cats to show you the way out. <laughs> so he's got cats powers yeah they sort of follow him around and also obviously the crow follows him around and sits on his shoulder and things so i don't yeah. know if it's just generally affinity with animals but mm. also i mean the cat he had before he was dead as well so mm. it was his cat so maybe he just likes cats yeah. and they just like him yeah yeah something that we've not actually touched on in the film but it's happened on both is the dark sense of humor mm. there's always sort of like one-liners in the film which are said in jest and that they work really well it's not too cheesy but it was in the 90s but then in the comic there's also the same thing which is you know after some guy's shot the cop's like oh what happened to him it's like huh lead poisoning <laughs> um, which it's just him because he you know he's he doesn't give a shit he's out there killing people because they killed him and it all works and yeah I, I like the sort of dark sense of humor in this works well with the tone of the film 
It's not just a random quip thrown in, then they move on. I can imagine this character saying something like that, very much like Dredd. He's a little bit crazy, in a way. Yeah. You know, when he's doing the jokes about, you know, Jesus walks into a bar, throws three nails at the barman and says, can you put me up for the night? Yeah. <laughs> and things like that. You know, these, these silly little jokes that he throws in there, you know, it shows that there's a comedic side to the character, but they're always very macabre jokes. They're always quite dark and, uh, yeah, re- usually relating to religion or death or despair. Yeah. But still very funny. And then there's the moments where he's just obviously very on the nose quoting, uh, I don't know, was it in the comic book that he quoted The Raven or was it just in the film? That was just in the film because I was waiting for that in the comic, yeah. but that was just in the film, which I thought that was kind of odd quoting a different bird, but also the fact that his name's Raven pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his surname is is De Raven, and uh, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, <laughs> it's so on the nose, but um I love it for it. Well, talking about something crazy, should we step away from the... I don't know, it's not, it's not really crazy this week, <laughs> but should we step away from the uh, pain and despair of the artwork, I guess, and go into uh, Easter eggs? A little bit of fun Easter eggs? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Lay lay your crow eggs on me, baby. Ian's, Ian's egg hunt. Ian's, Ian's egg hunt. Ian's, Ian's egg hunt. I'm not yoking you. Right, well, you very nearly danced around this in the film section, but I'll I'll explain why in a second. Okay. But when they were deciding on the look of the crow in the film, a makeup artist applied the face paint on Lee, but they saw it was too neat and too clean. Hmm. So what they decided to then do is that Lee would paint it on himself the night before the shoot, go to bed wearing the paint, and then when he woke up, it was very worn out and used yeah. And it gave that sort of grimy look to it, which they preferred that look rather than the sort of clean thing. Hmm. And the bit that you very nearly danced around was the fact that uh, this is what Heath Ledger used as inspiration. Yeah. He did the exact same thing with the makeup. And yeah, actually, earlier on, I was going to chuck in this, but I didn't actually say it, was that um, you can definitely see essences of the Joker from The Crow. Yeah. Uh, like in The Crow, there's the last guy he goes to kill at top dollars hideout lair club whatever it is mm. and he sits on the table it's almost beat for beat like a scene in the dark knight with the pencil scene yes yeah and he goes in and sort of he's in front of all these like all these gangsters mm-hmm. obviously it's a bit different but this is one of the biggest inspirations that i think keith took for that character which yeah. I, I quite like that it's passed on but then also you've got the tragic death of him as well not on set but this is where the whole cursed thing comes from, I guess, is that mm. you know anything that comes in contact with the crow is cursed. But I don't know. I'm not really into that sort of supernatural hocus pocus. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But yeah. And there is no Stan Lee cameo in this because he didn't write it. But there is a James O'Barr cameo. What? What? Who did he play? So when the pawn shop is blown up yep. and Eric's talking to the cop, the cop gets distracted by some people that are trying to loot the place. So as he looks up, one of the looters is James O'Barr. Right, okay. There you go. Yeah, because I think he spoke about, he became quite close friends with Brandon Lee. Yeah. Which is just another tragedy on top of a tragedy, quite frankly. It's so, uh, yeah. yeah. Anyway. There's also, this one's not, well, I mean, I guess it is an egg, but um, the, the, there's a bit in the film, in the car chase scene, when um, I think it's Skank that's driving the car, and he drives through a bunch of like water tank things, and the water covers the his sight so he, he can't see because the car's just covered in water yeah. and he tries to wipe it away from the inside of the car which i thought is that stupid what's he doing and i thought oh they're just trying to show how stupid this character is mm. but then in the comic the crow kills one of t-bird's friends in the car mm. and t-bird tries to turn on his wipers and the crow says like you idiot the blood's on the inside yeah so they may have added that bit into the film it's like a little homage to the comics yes or i might be reading into that too much <laughs> no, I, th- I think that's close yeah i think it sort of feels like it should be an homage if even if it's not mm. yeah this one's not an easter egg and you did say this earlier on but i've got something to add to it okay you know there's the crow symbol that he sets on fire and he goes like and it just sort of shows a burning kind of bird yeah that instantly made me think of ben affleck's daredevil when uh, the cop just throws a, a lit cigarette at a bunch of oil on the floor which is not safe at all on a crime scene on a crime scene yeah <laughs> in front of some trains you know <laughs> but i think they were trying to homage that film yeah but ended up just sucking terribly <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Not that many this week, but I thought I'd try and show show my uh, egg hunting skills. It's not the number of eggs that counts, but 
how you use them. How tasty they are. Sure. Let's go with that. Anyway, conclusion? Yeah. Yeah, all right. So just... Go on, just go on. <laughs> Sorry. So just briefly, overall then, film, the comic book. I mean, I'm getting the feeling you liked them, but you know, just sum up your feelings briefly. Yeah, so I, I can now see why it's a cult classic. It definitely stands the test of time, which I didn't think that it would do. And I keep hearing they want to remake this film. And what I say to them is don't. <laughs> Leave it. That's it. It's done. Don't try and remake a bunch of stuff. If you're going to remake it, just take the word The Crow off of it and make it its own thing. Well, I think they've, they have already remade it once. They've got three sequels and they are working on another one. Yeah. I've... Being, what's his name? Bill Skarsgård, I believe, is playing Eric Draven. That's the current rumour, yeah. Because hmm. I don't know if that's actually true. But over the years, there's been several names attached to the project. Jason something, Aquaman. Jason Momoa. Thank you. He was attached before Bill. Right. And then I said throughout the years, there's people like Tom Hiddleston was apparently rumoured to be it. Mm. Luke Evans. Right. Bradley Cooper. I, you know, the, this, is, this is going back years and years and years. So anyone who was famous at the time it just wants to be in the lead. But just don't do it. Yeah. There are sequels to the film. Uh, and there are sequels to the comic, in fact. And they're always based on different characters. Okay. So they are different characters who have suffered similar injustices and are brought back as the Crow. But they are not Eric Draven. Oh. So that is the way that the sequels have worked in the comic books and the films. So, you know, I always feel like they should go that route rather than trying to reboot Eric Draven. But yeah, hey. Yeah. Anyway, but yeah, so me saying don't make any more films of this pretty much shows that I love it. It's a great film. I, might, I will have to rewatch it at some point without having to make notes <laughs> and just really enjoy it for what it is. Yeah. Your thoughts on the film? I really enjoy it. Yeah, I remember vague memories of watching it when I was younger and thinking it was okay. But no, I really enjoyed the film. It's sort of schlocky B-movie, but yeah. very enjoyable at the same time, you know, almost because of that. I enjoy it a lot. Yeah, like the comic book, Steeped in Atmosphere. And, you know, that is mm -hmm. one of the strengths of the, the comic book. And, and if the film didn't have that, I think it would have been a failure of a film. You know, I think the plot is less relevant to adapting this source material as the actual feel of the comic book is. Yeah. You know, and having a, a real mood to it. And that's, I think, part of the reason why they made him... Because uh, obviously, like you said, the comic is very... There's a musical quality to it. Yeah. a lyrical quality to a lot of it. So in the film, they made him a musician. Yes. Whereas he's not in the comic book, he's a mechanic. So I liked that they didn't do the literal thing, but they kept the tone very consistent. Yes. And the comic book? Again, I, I've said it before, I'll say it again. Hauntingly beautiful. That's just my summary of the comic. Very nice. Yeah, I was really won over by it as well. And I think, as I said, 13, 14 year old me, if I'd read it at the time, this was actually my first time reading it. Oh, nice. I didn't ask. I no, apologize. that's right. But 13, <laughs> 13, 14 year old me, if I'd read it at that time in my life, I think it would have had a far more profound effect. And I can see why it became as popular as it did. And yeah, I, I think it's like you say, just steeped in atmosphere as well. And it's uh, it is coming from a place of complete earnestness. And that's yeah. why even the sort of extended excerpts of poetry and things like that they're things that kind of annoy me sometimes i find them a little bit pretentious at times but not here yeah it works really well here yeah it's coming from a genuine place i think that's the difference and it is something that is so linked to this atmosphere that he's trying to create and that sort of gothic vibe that yeah it just works really well and what was kate's quick opinion of the film so her quick opinion of the film was i think it's a great film which I'll tell you this. She said this before we watched it because she's seen it before and I hadn't. Oh, okay. So she said that first before I even put it on. And then I asked her again at the end and she said, her opinions haven't changed. I'm going to say, actually, I don't usually do Haley's quick opinion, but uh, I'll drop it in. Haley really liked this film. She was, you know, teenage goth. So obviously she did. Uh, she's, still, she's still a bit of a goth now, isn't she? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. She wears a lot more bright colours now. <laughs> but yeah, she, she used to really like this film and hasn't watched it in years and was quite afraid to go back to it. But yeah, she was really happy that it stacked up as well so four for four on the crow which is good but i think that's it for the crow for this episode any other business yeah i'll tell you what we haven't done for a while what's that hello hey ian hey ian hey ian what, what have you been, been up to lately what have you been up to lately I've been to the cinema a little bit. Ooh. I watched Thor Love and Thunder. Still haven't seen it. Still not seen it. No, you told me yesterday you hadn't seen it. So I'm not going to go into spoiler territory. Thank you. But um, as you know, from a couple of episodes ago, I really enjoyed Ragnarok. Mm -hmm. 
And there seems to be a lot of strong feelings about this one with the film. Yeah. And some people absolutely loving it, some people hating it, tearing it apart. You know, yes. I would say it's fine. <laughs> right. It's okay. A lot of the humour didn't land for me. I okay. mean, that was the problem. I found it reasonably entertaining as a whole, but there was just so much of this comedy. And that's fine, as long as it's funny. But a lot of the comedy just, I didn't find funny. I was like, I can get on with it, please. And then um, the people like Christian Bale, I mean, he's an excellent and apparently starring in a completely different film to everyone else because he is playing... A... <laughs> right, okay. One of those. One of those films. Yeah, exactly. But no, he's um, he's really... <laughs> but the rest of the film is just... I mean, the best way I can say it is... Uh, so Ragnarok used uh, Led Zeppelin as a sort of leitmotif yep. for every time Thor did cool stuff. This one uses Guns and Roses. Yeah, like in the trailer. Yeah. And the difference in the quality of those two bands is the difference in the quality of these two films. <laughs> Right, okay. Do you reckon it's been absorbed into the MCU a bit too much than Ragnarok? Because well, Ragnarok was like a bit of a fresh breath of air. Yeah. Whereas Love and Thunder might be now bleeding, or the MCU bleeding in- into it a bit and trying to be overly funny. I don't know, actually. I mean, Ragnarok was very funny, but I thought more of the humour landed. It worked. Yeah, it, it just was generally better yeah. paced and um, better handled with the comedy. I just felt this one went very overtly comedic in the wrong places. But right, there's okay. not a huge amount of MCU tie-in. Okay. So I don't think that is it. I just genuinely think that the people making it thought it was a lot funnier than it actually was. Is probably the answer. They thought every line they were dropping in there was hilarious. Right. And that would save the film, but it wasn't and it didn't. Okay. So a bit of a letdown. A little bit, yeah, because I really like Ragnarok. Yeah, I just felt a little bit... I mean, as I said, I didn't hate it. I'm not going to say it's, like, terrible. I'm not going to rip it apart and things like that, as I've seen some people doing. It's fine. It's two hours of entertainment, Mm -hmm. but it's it's not a great film. I think that's the thing with anything after Endgame that now comes around. Everyone will be like, oh, it's such an average film. Therefore, it's bad. Hmm. Like, well, it's just average is fine. <laughs> yeah. Average is average. Like, average right. is average. I kind of just want someone to just make something that's more self-contained. Yeah. Just make their own self-contained, focus on making it a good film. Kind of like the Batman did, which mm-hmm. I don't think was without flaws, but it was very much its own thing. I know it's set in a wider universe and you can have little tips of the hat to that, but I want someone to just say, right, I just want them to focus on making a better film, basically. Yeah. I'm getting a little bit of Marvel fatigue with Phase 4. A lot of it isn't landing for me. Yeah, we were talking about this yesterday, weren't we? Yeah, we were. And again, I don't think much of it's bad. I just think it's a lot of it's, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, just like, eh, that's a, a fun two hours. Yeah. Let's go do something else. Yeah, exactly. Not like, oh my god, that just happened. He just picked up Mjolnir. Oh my god. <laughs> he just picked up something else. I don't know. I Stormbreaker, there you go. <laughs> I haven't seen it. I don't know. <laughs> You're just mostly excited by people picking up hammers, it seems. <laughs> I just love DIY. <laughs> But yeah, anyway, do you want to do one more? Do you want me and then we'll do back and forth? Ah, yeah, we'll do back and forth. What have you been up to lately? All right. So I have, I think I said ages ago, last time we did, what have you been up to lately? That I was catching up on The Flash and DC's Legends of Tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I completely stopped watching it and then I realised that I'd forgot to watch it. So I had to catch up all over again. So I literally binged the rest of The Flash. The doorbell? Yeah, so I literally binged the rest of The Flash, which I watched the last, well, the current one this morning before coming on air. Right. Which, it's season eight now. Jesus. And it's still going, it's still going well, I think. Mm-hmm. It, well, it's still going, really. <laughs> it has a lot of heart to it, but I think they are kind of just treading water a bit until it finishes. Yeah. Yet, weirdly, it's been renewed for season nine, oh, where oh. all the other sort of Arrowverse stuff has been cancelled. Mm. And also, a lot of the original cast aren't in it anymore. I mean, you've still got the Flash. He's still with yeah. it. But then his other half, Iris West, she keeps coming and going. It's a bit odd. Yeah, she's spoken out recently about it, hasn't she? She said yeah. she had very bad conditions on set or something. A very bad uh, mistreatment of, of characters. I don't know. I don't watch The Flash, so I don't care enough to read the article. I just saw the headlines. Yeah, just saw bits and bobs. But yeah, it's, I, I reckon season nine will be its last season. But I think, because I'm up to date with it in the UK, but not the States. Right. And I think I've got about, uh, I want to say three episodes left, four episodes left for season eight. I think there's about 20 episodes, I think, or season 16. I wonder if they're prolonging the demise of the Flash TV series to try and get people to forget about the Flash in the films. <laughs> 
Maybe. Because I think they were going the other way, weren't they? They were trying to get rid of all the TV shows so they could focus more on the films. Yeah. But then obviously everything with the Flash film and everything surrounding it is a massive shit show. So uh, yep. it doesn't look like that's going to happen. So perhaps they're trying to make go back the other way now. With the Flash actor, I can't remember, uh, Grant Gustin, mm. he's such a good actor as the Flash. His Flash and his Barry Allen, it's really, really good. I just think by season six... They sort of run out of ideas. Right, yeah. And it's a very much like, oh, he's just going to keep running. Yeah. Yay. But, I mean, it was always the fun show out of the Arrowverse. Right. It had heart, where, like, Arrow was very like, oh, God, I'm so broody. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Jesus, yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, also just to literally very, very quickly cover the other thing that I said, I watched season seven of Legends of Tomorrow. That's the final season, right? That has now finished, and I have watched to the end. Mm -hmm. But annoyingly, it was cancelled before that season was finished. So it ended on a cliffhanger. Oh. And that's it. Damn. But I suppose what they could do is pick it up on a different Arrowverse show. Yeah. But then they've only got The Flash going now. Batwoman's been cancelled, I think. Yeah. Supergirl's been cancelled. Mm -hmm. This has been cancelled. Arrow was stopped anyway. Superman and Lois is still going, but they haven't they said that's not part of the Arrowverse? Yeah, which I don't, I'm not quite up to date with that one. But I found it quite weird because he was introduced in Supergirl as her cousin. Yeah. And then, then now going, no, 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 we're not part of it anymore. Weird. W well, you were, but anyway. It's a shit show. What else have you been up to lately? <laughs> well, Southampton Comic Con is actually running this weekend. It's today and yesterday. And Harbour Lights were doing a tie-in where they showed back-to-back Back to the Future trilogy. Ooh. So uh, all three of the films, and we went along, and they are as good as I remember. It was great fun. The first one, I think, is as close to a perfect script as one can get. You know, there is, honestly, there is no baggage in that film. Everything is either a setup or a payoff. Yes. It is a really, really good script. And I think the sequels are perhaps not as good, but still really entertaining. I love them. And it was great to just see them on the big screen. In addition to that, I... A uh, little extra bonus. I got to meet the DeLorean. So that was very Ooh. cool. I don't know if it's the DeLorean. Your fanboy heart just almost gave out. <laughs> it was great. I did a little I did a little Slav squat in front of it and uh, <laughs> give him a double thumbs up. It looked inside. They got all the like props inside and stuff. So like, oh, it's all reproduction stuff, but it was really cool. It was just sat outside Ooh. Harbour Lights on the water. So you watched, great fun. you watched all three back to back? Yep, in the cinema. So it was back to back to back, back to the future. That's the one. Nice. What about you? You mean, what else have I been up to lately? Yeah, I'm oh, sorry. I ask a fucking question every time. Hey, Ian. <laughs> I'll play the intro again, shall I? Hey, Ian. <laughs> every time. What have you been up to lately? Um, well, I am back on the supernatural train. Choo-choo. <laughs> I took a break for a while because I was watching it far too quickly. I was just binging it literally a season every like four days. Yeah. And I thought, right, I have to slow down because otherwise it'll be over soon and I'll have no more to watch. So I stopped at the end of season 10 and I lasted about a month. I didn't watch it for about a month. Ooh. And then I just started mid last week, started watching season 11. I mean, I really like it. It is starting to become one of my favourite shows because I, I like the characters, I like the actors, it, you know, going back to it after season three of The Boys with um, Dean yep. uh, Jensen in it mm -hmm. you know i do like that actor and i want to see him in, in a lot more stuff my one little bit of gripe with it which i've been speaking to someone at work about this who also is a fan of it and she goes to the sci-fi conventions and she's met the cast and all sort of stuff right is that it does seem to be very much like one season for example sam does something bad like evil and then feels bad about it and then dean has to then do something to save him even though he doesn't want to be saved and then end of the season the next season the thing that Dean's done to save Sam is bad. So now he feels bad about it and Sam <laughs> has to save him. And it's a bit of rinse and repeat. Just like, oh, I feel bad and I've got to do this. And that's the one bit that I feel a little bit, come on. Well, it ran for like 16 seasons, didn't yeah. it? Yeah. Something stupid. I mean, I'm on season 11, about four episodes in. Like there was one bit that something happened and you think, oh my God, that's quite a big plot thread. And the next episode is, it's just fixed. I'm like, oh, <laughs> all right. I thought that, that would be part of the like the big season arc. But yeah. No, it's fixed in, in an episode. But no, I mean, apart from a couple of gripes, I mean, even my favorite shows I do have issues with. Yeah. yeah. It's a fun watch. Like, I'm on season 11 now. Of course, I'm going to see it through. I probably won't be watching the Supernatural prequel that they're making. Not sure if you, if you heard about that. I heard they were doing something like that, yeah. Yeah, it's called The Winchesters, and it's about their parents who... I, I don't care enough to, to look into it, but it's about their parents. Has it got Jeffrey Dean Morgan in it? No, it's younger actors. So right. it's them when they were... Not kids, but when they were younger. But I think that Jensen does the voiceover as Dean. It's like a flashback, and I don't quite understand. I don't care enough to watch that. Nah. I've got too much stuff that I'm watching, and... Yeah. <laughs> I'll give it a season. Probably, yeah. Probably two. 
But yeah, have you been up to anything else lately? <laughs> All right, let's skip through these. I started not one, but two new Arkham Horror the Card Game campaigns. Ooh. including one with regular guest host John from Octothorpe Cast. So, uh, Johnny boy! Shout out to John. That's all I have really to say about that. It's possibly my favourite card game, and it's good to be playing it again. Yeah. What else? Oh, uh, I'll tell you what. Since we've done episodes on them, both The Boys and Umbrella Academy have come back. Yep. Have you been watching them? What do you think? Yeah. Well, Kate hadn't seen... The Boys Season 2 anyway, so we had to re-watch that. Mm -hmm. Well, I had to re-watch that. It's fine, because I forgot a bunch that happened anyway. So together we watched Season 1, 2, and 3 of The Boys and The Umbrella Academy. Yeah, overall, really good. The Boys, I think, stronger than Umbrella Academy. Definitely. I think the Umbrella Academy works well. You know what I'm like with Easter eggs and you know going online to watch stuff. And because I didn't like The Boys, the comic, I've gone away and watched a bunch of stuff online about the show. But because I enjoyed Umbrella Academy comic, I've not gone online to watch stuff about season three. Right. Because I've not yet read, because I want to read the comics. Gotcha. So I don't want them spoiled for me. Yeah. But yeah, season three worked, I think, of Umbrella Academy. Mm-hmm. Bounced off it a little bit here and there, but I personally think they handled Elliot Page's transition well. Yes, I think they did as well. Yeah, and we obviously talked about it in our podcast episode about umbrella academy we weren't sure yes. how they were going to handle the situation at the time but yeah. i think they handled it really well just you know get it in early have everyone accept it and move on yeah. as they should and it really endears the cast to you mm. when that has happens when the characters as well so i think that works well i think it has the same problems of the other series which is there are is a bit of a leisurely pace at times yeah. you have a lot of people retreading the same conversations obviously i was surprised by how close to the mark we were when we were discussing allison during our episode how her trajectory went this series we talked about obviously the corrupting ability of her power oh yeah and yeah, yeah, yeah. obviously yeah and, and as for the boys i mean honestly it's probably one of my favorite superhero media out there at the moment and mm. it is funny because like you say we both bounce off of the comic book neither of us enjoys it that much we think it's violent and horrible and over the top and yes the- tv show is all of those things well yeah 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 to be fair (laughs) but it does it in such a better way it is honestly one of the best satires that tv is putting Mm. out of both you know modern american politics of (laughs) social media trends of uh, you know was it they did the a train doing the kardashian coca-cola commercial you know (laughs) all all of that stuff is it really is just a if you're going to use this as a, a superheroes as a metaphor for commercialization and consumerism yeah really just lean high into that and make it properly a real pastiche on on modern america i think it's a really good move and um yeah i'd say possibly one of my favorite superhero things going on at the moment yeah i do like that you've managed to shoehorn in more more urban into our uh into our show oh, baby. again <laughs> yeah more carl urban i'm not ready to leave this urban area <laughs> stay in here is that all you've got you got you got anything else i think that's all i've got what about you yeah um hold on oh hey ian Yes, Ian. What have you been up to lately? Oh, thank, I'm, I'm glad you asked. Me and Kate have been playing a game. <laughs> so we don't normally talk about games, apart no. from card games. It's called It Takes Two. Right. It's a PS4 co-op game. When I explain it to people, they're like, huh? It's, it's, it's a bit odd. But eventually, it's a couple that are married that are going to get a divorce. And they've got a kid. And so they tell the kid, and the kid goes to her room... And she has little, like, dolls. And she sort of cries on the dolls. But then, like, it weirdly turns her parents into those dolls. Right. And then you have to work together as a couple to get back to the house. Okay. You think you wake up in, like, a barn. You're quite small, so you can, like, go meet, like, bees and wasps and spiders and monkey dolls. And all these toys come to life. It's really crazy, but each level, if you will, so you've got different things. You, know, you can fly, you can shoot, but you have to work together. Was it sort of a platformer? That sort of game? Uh, like, a, like a 3D um, game. <laughs> I don't, I, whenever I hear platform, I always think of like Sonic or something. It's not quite, it's not 2D. No, but no, pl- platformers <laughs> don't. No, so it's it's like a, it's like an adventure game. You have to complete levels and, and move your way yeah. through them. Yeah, okay. like for w- one level, I think I had to jump up somewhere to then stand on something and open a door to Kate to get through. Yeah. And then once she was through, she had to open up a thing for me. And it's a game where couples in real life have arguments over it because it's so intense that you right. you can't not argue. I think someone said to Kate the other day at work that have played it, you wait till you get to the spider level or the tarantula bit. I can't remember. But we've, we've not got up to that bit yet. Apparently that's the worst bit. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Something to look forward to then. Yeah, exactly. So we've not played it for a while because I, I don't know where that <laughs> is. <laughs> 
Um, but no, that's it, it is a fun game that you can sort of pick up and put down. It's a bit different. I, I do like a good old two player game, like a good co op game. Yeah, it sounds good. Um, it's not online either. It's it's a split screen, yeah. so you, you're both in the same room, which I do prefer sometimes rather than online play. There's been a few of those lately. I think it's coming a bit more prevalent is having these sort of multiplayer co op platform type. There's one where you have to escape from jail together mm-hmm. and things like that. But that That's fun. Cool. That is called something good i can't remember (laughs) i honestly can't remember what that's called and on that note (laughs) is that all you've got yeah i mean i was going to talk about miss marvel but i've only watched the first two episodes so that's not yeah because i've seen all of that and i yeah (laughs) i I enjoyed miss marvel i just think that the next three episodes you've got are probably the weakest of the series it's got that mid marvel slump on the disney plus yeah disney plus show it just feels like a very coming of age teen drama currently and that's not really my favorite topic to watch See, I, that was my favourite bit about it. I think they should have leaned more into that whole teens, family, community, running around, that sort of thing. Really lent heavily into that. Mm. I felt that it became a lot more generic in the sort of, I think, third, fourth, fifth episode, somewhere around there. Mid, mid episode. Actually, fifth was all right. But yeah. anyway, we'll talk about that once you've seen it. Yeah, why not? We'll save that for our two year. Yeah, sounds good. All right, well, that's it for this episode. Thank you once again for listening. If you enjoyed the show, why not give us a cheeky little subscribe and a five star rating? Next episode, would you believe it? It's our 50th episode. Who would have thought? 50? I know. Who would have thought we'd make it to the big 5-0? I know I didn't. Me neither. No, nah, to celebrate, we're covering not one, but two movies. Two? Featuring the world's finest superhero, Superman, in what, for some reason, we're calling our superman size special. So, join us as we watch the 1978 Superman and compare it to 2013's Man of Steel. We're also going to be reading two different comic book origins, tackling first the character's debut in action comics and Superman number one, before moving on to John Byrne's The Man of Steel. It sounds like a very super episode. Man, you're right. Of steel. Goodbye, everybody. See ya. What have you been up to? Lately. Oh wait, have we haven't we got a new theme song for that or something? So we got like the phone call thing. I'll drop it in. Oh yeah, put it in then. And put it in now. No, I'm gonna put it in at the start of the segment. Oh, okay. Should we start should we start the segment? We should probably start the segment. I'll save this bit for the after credits. <laughs> <laughs> you prick. <laughs>